I'm very excited. Today is a very special, important day. I had been thinking about this event idea for a couple of years now, and everything just came together and aligned itself. So I'm happy to have a wonderful panel of amazing women, um, some that I know personally and some that I'm hoping to get to know further um, on a more deeper level in the future because they're all doing amazing work in their own individual um, field. So I'm very happy to have them here this, this afternoon. Um, happy Women's History Month um, and welcome to this symposium. Uh, we are honoring different women in the community. I've been putting out a bunch of different videos honoring different women in the community who have stepped up, especially during the pandemic. We honored an OBGYN doctor, a business property manager, and we will be uh, dropping our new video, highlighting an educator in the district as well. And we have just so many amazing women doing amazing things in the workforce now. And today we are just examining how, how does the workforce look now, especially during a pandemic. Women are only making 82 cents for every dollar earned by men. And, you know, in 2021, we are really trying to level the playing fields and make sure that this is no longer the truth and, and, and an absent memory. Um, in Albany, I am working on a bunch of initiatives uh, to help uplift women, especially in the workforce. I'm working on a couple of pieces of legislation this year. One is called the Salary Disclosure Act, which will make sure, will, which will mandate that employers disclose the salary ranges for each position within their, their companies. And this will be a very crucial step in the right direction where women will stop having to negotiate, negotiate against themselves because that happens far too often. I'm also working on the FAIR Act, which will uh, mandate that companies provide reports on their employment screening tools or tests. Uh, we're seeing a lot of you know, facial recognition tools being used um, and we're just trying to have transparency in all of the, the employment tools that are being used in the hiring process, because we know that sometimes it may not be in our favor. So we want to make sure that companies are using the least discriminatory uh, tool that is possible so that we can make sure that we have a diverse workforce. So I'm very happy today to be here again with my amazing panelists, who will all offer uh, their own unique um, experience and, and their approach to, to the workforce and helping more of us get into different places of, of positions of power. Um, I'm, I'm always of the, the mindset that we need women in all of these positions because women, we uplift each other, we look out for each other, and um, we need more of us in different positions. So I'm happy to have each and every one of the panelists that are here with us today. So we have three panelists and we have uh, uh, another um, a speaker at the end who will share her individual story of looking for jobs during this time. And uh, we will start with Ms. Yanil Nunez. Uh, and then they will just speak about themselves and speak about um, their, their approach to tackling and getting into the workforce during this time. Uh, Ms. Yanil is a recruit, recruitment manager at KIPP NYC. So we will allow her to introduce herself and share some amazing tips that will help many women during this time. So thank you, Yanel, for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I agree with everything that you said, that it's important that we're uplifting each other and that women are in different career spaces and sharing what their journey has looked like. So to get started, I wanted to share who am I, right? So my name is Yanel Nunez. I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, an aunt, an avid traveler a lifelong learner. I love, love, love to read. Um, I'm Latina and I'm also first gen. And you're probably wondering why all of this matters. That's because when I pair it with who I am in my, with my credentials, I have a BA in sociology and psychology from Stony Brook University, a master's degree in organizational psychology from Columbia University. And then I have two roles. So my day-to-day -day, nine to five is that I'm a recruitment manager at KIPP NYC. And then for my side hustle, I'm a job search coach at Bossed Up. So previous to my work as a recruitment manager at KIPP NYC, I was working as the assistant director of experiential education over at Columbia, where I had an opportunity to work with undergrads, graduate students, and alumni from Columbia University across all of the different disciplines to help them find the jobs that they were really interested in. 
So when I was pairing the who am I of being Latina, of being first gen and all of the things, part of the reason I decided to go to KIPP NYC was because it brought me back to what it was that I wanted to do long term. So at KIPP NYC, I worked directly to recruit teachers, to recruit, recruit different staff members, to serve low socioeconomic areas. So it's black and brown students in low socioeconomic areas. And that also ties into being mission oriented. I didn't get fulfilled at Columbia because while I was doing all of the job search related things, I was doing it for a privileged community. And that's just me being honest about, you know, when you pay $60,000 a year for your education, there's way more resources available to you. And I wasn't able to work directly with first generation low income students at the scale that I was hoping to do so. So I ask this question because I think it's important for everyone to start there whenever they're thinking about their job search. Who are you? What are your credentials? But more importantly, who, how do you bring your full self to the table? Getting a better understanding of what you need. Um, and that's going to help you identify what it is that you want, right? So for me, it's really important to have that traditional sort of nine to five schedule because then it gives me an opportunity to organize my life around all of the other things, right? My side hustle wouldn't be as possible if I didn't have as much of a consistent schedule in my more traditional work role. And similarly, I wouldn't be able to be present on the weekends for my nephews if I didn't have every weekend off. Um, I also have the benefit of having all of the educational holidays off. So right now this week is spring break across the Department of Education in New York. And so that gives me an opportunity to spend even more time with my nephews, whereas you know my siblings who are all in healthcare and law enforcement don't get that same privilege. I get to spend those days with them and that's really fun for me. Um, and then thinking about the benefits too, like again, I'm an avid traveler, so for me, having a significant amount of PTO is really important. Health insurance, if you um, are looking to, you know, save on down pay, I mean, on co-pays and things of that nature, you might want to have a union job that will, you know, save you long term on health insurance. Is the company offering retirement options, 401k, stock, things of that nature? Are you moving for the role, right? Traditionally, not everyone is going to, traditionally, everyone was thinking about doing something local. Now people are moving across the country for jobs of their dreams. Now with the pandemic, we're thinking about remote work. What does that look like? Is it something that you're interested in long-term? And of course, the, the biggest question that I think anybody has when looking at for a job is salary. What is it that you need, right? If I'm using myself as an example, when I graduated with my uh, bachelor's degree from Stony Brook University, I thought I was making sufficient money, but I also wasn't paying for rent because I was still at home with my mom and my mom was sort of like, I'll take care of the rent, you can help with groceries and things of that nature. Um, so at the time I thought, okay, great, this is working out for me. Now it looks very different because I'm a homeowner. So a mortgage has to get paid. And I have to keep in mind all of those things when looking for new careers. The good news is, is that Goldman Sachs, Forbes, everyone is sort of predicting this hiring boom within the pandemic. Granted, we don't necessarily know what that looks like if it's a boom in the entry level positions, if it's a boom in the mid level positions, or even at the managerial higher COO position, executive roles. Um, but that's really good news, right? CNN Business is reporting it, CNBC Make it is reporting it, Forbes, and these are articles that are fairly recent. You'll see that the Forbes article was written on March 25th. Um, one of them was written in January. So we're, we're already set, seeing like a really good trend. And I'm hoping that that's going to make everyone feel much more positive about the job search because I can see how that offers and creates a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. Now, the best way for you to sort of defeat that anxiety is to create a plan. I added the quote by Benjamin Franklin that if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. So one of the things that will help you alleviate whatever stress is coming from the job search is to identify what it is that you want, right? Start with the who am I, what is it that I want, and then creating a plan. 
in that plan, you want to think about the skills that will translate to future jobs, clarify that, right? How can you identify what transferable skills you have? Um, I think one of the most underrated jobs is the role of an administrative assistant. As an admin assistant, I think oftentimes we find ourselves imagining that the person's only picking up phone calls, that there's not a lot being done, um, or that there's just like calendaring, but there's actually a lot of transferable skills because the admin assistant role is something that looks different across industry and across job function. Um, you also wanna identify which positions you should be applying for. So in my last role, for example, as the assistant director of experiential education, one of the things that I recognized was that so many people had no idea what that title meant. It sounded really fancy, but it meant that I had to make it a point to illustrate what that role was within the bullet points so that when I was looking at identifying those positions that I could apply for, I wasn't just limiting myself to things that were associate director, which is considered the next level up, at least in higher education from that role. Um, and that was what was able to open me up to other opportunities. And I'll share in a bit what sort of job search uh, engines you should be looking for. The other thing is, is that you want to make time for your resume and cover letter reviews. This is going to look different across the board because if you're looking at a role within marketing, something that you're going to want to emphasize on your resume is that you have a skill set of making an image look good and that resume is going to serve as your image. So you're going to have a much more creative style resume than the traditional resume that I would have considering that my job functions have all been different, but my industry has always been education. Your cover letter is a little bit more traditional and that you're going to have like an introductory paragraph and your body paragraphs are going to focus on the roles that you've held that are directly related to the position that you're applying for. And then you also want to build your personal brand. This is going to be significant across like your social media channels, for example. So it's not to say so much that Instagram is going to be something that impacts the job and it shouldn't be used against you, but LinkedIn is definitely a great resource in that it serves as an online resume and allows recruiters to find you. So that's going to be the personal brand that you want to create. And then you also want to learn how to storytell throughout your interview. So once you get invited to an interview as part of your job search, you want to be able to identify what it is that you are going to translate, right? So if you are applying for a role within recruitment, what they want to know is that you're good at relationship building. So what previous things have you done that can emphasize that? You want to get really good about being able to share verbally what those experiences are, right? And your resume, you're doing it from a written perspective. And then in the interview, you have an opportunity to do so verbally and to even show through your body language how enthusiastic you are about the role. And then the next thing is to think about strategic networking. How can you utilize the people that you already know to expand on? I think so many of us are really afraid to reach out to our friends and, and just admit like, hey, I'm in a place where I'm looking for a job. But you'd be surprised what a difference it would make if you were just a little bit more vulnerable about what your experience is because as women, we need to be sharing these conversations a little bit more. We need to be honest about what it is that we're making, where we're located, what we're doing, how we negotiated, things of that nature, to really see a change in that wage gap, for sure. Um, you know, I'm constantly referring back to the fact that a Latina is making half as much as a white man, right? We're making like 54 cents compared to the dollar that a, a white man is making. And I'm always encouraged to think about like, all right, who is in a position that I'm interested in? How do I communicate with them that I'm interested in that position? And I would love to learn how they got there. That's strategic networking, making, being intentional about making friends with people who are in the places that you want to be in. In terms of resources for your job search. So these are probably the top four resources that I would use at different stages of that job search. So LinkedIn is a primary resource and that again, it serves as an online resource, allows you to create a resume and a brand to the larger public that makes a huge difference. Um, and then you have Glassdoor. Glassdoor is a great resource when you want to identify what the salary range for a position is. So on Glassdoor, people will anonymously 
anonymously report what their uh, salaries are for a specific position at a specific company in a specific location. That's all really important because if you're applying for a job at Google, you're not going to get paid the same as a recruiter in New York at Google in comparison to as a recruiter in maybe like Colorado or South Dakota, et cetera, even though you still work at the same company. And that's because the company is keeping in mind the cost of living. Indeed is also a great resource in that a lot of companies will post their positions there as they do on LinkedIn. The one thing to keep in mind with Indeed though, is that you want to make sure that you're applying for jobs that have been posted within the week. So as a recruiter, whenever you're posting on Indeed, you pay Indeed to publicize that role. So because you're paying for a minimum of 30 days, that role will likely appear for 30 days as if it's available. But oftentimes within the two week mark, companies are already moving forward and in interviewing. So sometimes you might see things are available with Indeed and they're not. And I, I've seen personally with the clients that I've worked with that they get easily discouraged because they think, okay, no one's calling me back. But it's also because they're applying for jobs that have been posted for over 30 days. And at that point, the recruiter is likely not looking at the Indeed posting anymore. So that's also something to keep in mind. The two icons on the bottom right hand side are just the Apple podcast icon and the Spotify podcast icon. I threw that out there because I think it's a great opportunity to sort of get a better understanding of the career landscape. Uh, if you simply search professional development, you'll find all kinds of podcasts that will give you an opportunity to either learn how to update your resume, either learn how to, you know, how to advocate for yourself better. I'll be including one of the podcasts that I was recently featured on around negotiation, but it's definitely a great way to stay um, in tune with the things that are taking place. I think it's a great opportunity also just to stay current uh, with what's going on in the job market. So negotiation, when it comes to negotiation, you want to go in prepared. So use something like Glassdoor to identify what your salary ranges are so that it could be um, realistic and the employer doesn't think that you're like being ridiculous. But also keep in mind that your compensation package is exactly that. It's a package. Like it goes beyond what you're making hourly, annually, et cetera. How do your benefits play a factor? If you are paying for a health insurance premium that's $200 a month, you can kind of automatically deduct that from your, your salary and see like, okay, at the base, am I still where I want to be? Time off. Maybe you're a parent, you want to have some resolve with your kids so that you can go to Disney, whatever the case may be. There's things like that that you want to be able to negotiate. One of the things that we for sure are going to see an upward trend in terms of negotiation is that people are definitely going to be negotiating remote work. So that's something else to consider. Um, relocation costs is something that you can uh, negotiate, like maybe you're moving cross country, what does that mean? Do I get a $10,000 bonus to make sure that I'm moving everything? What does that look like? Are you going to add like a 30 day hotel stipend so that I can find living arrangements while I'm in this other place? All of that. The biggest question is, are you being realistic? Because you definitely don't want to ask for something that makes no sense. And you can use Glassdoor to do that. And you can also talk to your friends to, to get a better idea. On the right hand side, you'll see that I was featured on the Boston podcast and I focused on how to evaluate if a job offer is right for you. I hit on all of these points. You'll also see that it's a six minute podcast. Like you can get so much information in a short amount of time. So I definitely encourage you to take that opportunity. Um, and feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to be here. Um, and I just wanted to make a note of my email. Feel free to reach out to me at yanel.nunez at gmail.com. You can let me know that we've met through this uh, webinar and we can talk further about how your personal experiences are being impacted and how to move forward from there as it relates to your job search. Okay, now we have uh, Ms. Dante. Uh, she is the founder of Kick in the Door. A uh, motivational speaker. I saw a great video of her and I was like, oh, I need to have her on a panel because 
I need to figure out what mantra she has when she wakes up to do everything that she's doing. So um, we'll turn it over to Ms. Dante. Thanks for joining us. Of course. Hi, everyone. I'm Dante Clemens, the founder of Kick in the Door, and I am honored to be here. Kick is a consultancy that helps ambitious individuals develop a career that they enjoy. Um, I founded Kick in 2017 after successfully pivoting my own career from working as an architectural designer, designing buildings in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is where I'm from, to product management, where I work to develop digital applications, platforms, and products. So every app that's on your phone, there's a product manager building and designing that. That's essentially what I do day to day. And I sincerely want people to have access to a career that they desire, right? Like there's the opportunity equation, and then there's the preparation side of career development and readiness. And so Kick exists to solve the preparation problem. You can find more out about Kick at kickinthedoor.com and Kick in the Door on Instagram. So today we'll talk about values-based job hunting and my favorite, which is negotiations. So values-based job hunting is a philosophy that we use at Kick to evaluate companies of interest to see if they're a match for us even before applying to a job. It's a quick and efficient way to gauge whether or not your personal values align with the company that you're targeting. So much of what we hear about job hunting is hopefully begging that we get a job at a company. And this really kind of turns it around so that we are selecting the company that we want to work for versus just being grateful to get a job opportunity from said company. So the intention of values-based job hunting is to enable you to not only get a job, but to take the job that you'll be most fulfilled in. Because what's the point of working hard to get hired? if you'll be miserable once you're there. I think we've all gone through that experience. So here's how it works. So you define a set of things that you value most. Maybe you wanna work at a company that pays well, obviously, generally we all like money. Uh, you wanna work at a company that really values their employees, prioritizes diversity, and doesn't take themselves too seriously. Maybe you want every day to be casual Friday. You don't wanna to have to wear kitten heels at work. You wanna be able to wear Jordans and sneakers and so on. All of that is feasible, right? So let's say you're a marketing manager and theoretically you can be a marketer at any type of organization, but because you want to be paid well, you focus on industries that can support that. You might bypass nonprofits, for example, and focus on publicly traded companies or private companies. Next, you visit the website. You go through their LinkedIn profile. You even read through several job descriptions. What's their tone like? So many companies tell you what they value based on what they're hiring for, where they're investing, right? Because the types of job descriptions and the roles that they're hiring for also show you where they're willing to spend their own money. Who are they investing in? What departments are they investing in? All those things start to uh, demonstrate their values. The other thing to look at too, based on LinkedIn and the website is the leadership team. What's those folks backgrounds like? Did they all go to Ivy League schools or some of them go to public colleges? Are they diverse? Do they look like me and you? You know, what do they dress like? Are they wearing suit and ties? Are they wearing like just uncollared shirts, t-shirts and whatnot? These all signal to you what the culture is like at that company. Also, if there's a publicly traded company, one of my favorite things to do is to read their 10K filing document. It's in their re investor reports. It's required that they file that annually to the SEC. And the cool thing about a 10K form is that it tells you exactly how the business makes money, what they're afraid of, what the competitive landscape looks like, what their professional risks are. And it just helps you to get an understanding of the solvency of the company, like how profitable is this, is this company? Because the company has made $2 billion last year. You might want to come in with a stronger number because you know generally they have the budget for it. And again, so looking at the 10K report, like does it align with what you value? Does the company um, project their business um, their business investments and whatnot in a way that aligns with what you personally believe in. So the cool part is you get to take all of that knowledge and insights from that process and use it to apply thoughtfully to the job and then to ask compelling uh, questions in the interview process because all of that is research and that's actionable research. So if they check all the boxes for you and aligns with your personal values, you now have, I think, the basis for some good questions that you can ask of the interviewer and even potentially of your, of your future manager as well. And it's true that like every organization won't be a fit for you and that's okay. The goal of this process is to identify three to five organizations that fit what your values are. So that way you can more strategically put effort around applying to and securing jobs from those particular orgs. It's personally how I job hunt, it's how I advise every uh, kick client to job hunt. And it's just a more effective and efficient way to job hunt versus just blitzing every opportunity that you can find on Indeed and other job sites. 
So by asking these questions, you really get at the heart of what you value and in turn the attributes that you could evaluate every company by, even before you apply. So in some cases, the job description may be appealing, but during the interview, something feels off, different or unsettling. And at truth, it's just like you're not a good fit for the company, but sometimes when we're honest, we realize that the company isn't also a good fit for us. And that's oftentimes because our values don't align. And again, that's okay. You want to get ahead of that versus taking a job, getting into a role, and then 90 days in, hating your job and wanting to job hunt again to get out of that situation. So that is values-based job hunting. Um, I can talk about this stuff all day, but we're gonna move on to negotiations, which again, Yanil gave us, I think a really good baseline approach to negotiations. The kick philosophy is that negotiation is just one of the core ways to demonstrate your value to a potential employer. And the costs of not negotiation are tremendous, not negotiating are very high. So the Society of Human Resources Management estimates that over the course of a career, a person who did not negotiate a higher salary each time they began a new job would lose $500,000 to $1 million in lifetime income compared to a person who asked for more. So it's one of these decisions that if you don't get it right, the cost of it compounds in a negative way. You can make one strong decision in a negotiation conversation that sets you up to just kind of compound on that goodness of having that negotiation conversation early on. So negotiation can be easy. I find it easy. It's really enjoyable for me. And that's because I keep an objective mind about it. It's not personal, it's factual. So tools like salary.com, glassdoor.com, payscale, LinkedIn. And then there's this app called Blind. Blind is an app where people anonymously log on and literally tell you what, they offer, what their offers are from different companies. It's amazing because you can look at it by city. You can also see what, the, what your peers are getting paid. I had a job, my first job out of college, I didn't negotiate. I was offered $32,500. And I couldn't afford my own apartment. I didn't think about any of the expenses of my life or what those expenses would be. I was living at home at the time. And I had a careless coworker who left his pay stub out one day and I looked at his pay stub and he sat to my left. We did the exact same job and he was making $48,000. And that experience scarred me because I realized in dialogue with him, because of course I took him to lunch and I was like, hey, like, you know, tell me about how you got hired here, what your situation was, what your experience was. And I realized he negotiated. He gave them a starting baseline number that I didn't give. When they offered me 32.5, I was like, sure, yes. My first job out of college, I was honored to have a job. I paid the cost for that. And um, I learned that lesson early on. So I advocate for everybody, no matter the level of discomfort that you feel to have this conversation because it's worthy. It impacts your life, the life of your loved ones. When you make more money, you can bless more people. And it's also just fair, right? You're doing the work you deserve to get paid for. So those types of tools are good sites to establish a baseline number of what your skills are worth and compare that to salary data other candidates and employees have reported. The other thing too is like when you use tools like this, you get to see is the employer that you're targeting paying more than their competitors or less than. Sometimes if you're targeting an industry that isn't as desirable, like I was in pharmaceutical advertising, they would pay more than somebody that was working on consumer advertising, like on a Coca-Cola account, for example, because everybody wanted to work for Coca-Cola, but not everybody wanted to work for, you know, a medical uh, facility or something like that. So by looking at this data, you can also see like, where do you want to target your job search based on what your salary goals are? The other thing is like, what other factors are they offering in terms of comp? Do they offer signing bonuses? My personal favorite. Are they offering annual bonuses? Is stock available? So this will also give you a starting baseline of what vectors you can use as levers in your negotiation conversation. So certainly there's some risk and salary discussions. You can aim too high and price yourself out of a role. Some jobs that are really price sensitive or budget sensitive will kind of align with you upfront before you even start the interview process. And they'll ask you for a number upfront. It's always good to do your research and what I like to say is, I'm looking for something in this range. The range I give is always in about $20,000 range because it just gives them room to play with. And then I say, but everything is negotiable. I'm really interested in this company and in this role. So I would love to move forward in the process. I feel like we could work that stuff out on the back end. And generally they're like, Dante is a great candidate. By all means, yes, let's keep going. So I love that because it sets them up to understand like what kind of numbers you're looking for, but it doesn't box you into a specific number and it still allows for you and them to learn more about each other in the interview process. 
process. And then hopefully when they fall in love with you, they pull out all the stops to make sure that you say yes to their offer. So that's how I like the job hunt. It makes you the star because you are, you, you get to choose um, out of all the companies to work for, you wanna choose this one and they'd be blessed to have you. These companies love diverse candidates. They love having women. And the stuff that we bring to a job in terms of like our ethnicity, our culture, our way of thinking, we, when we talk about diversity, these are all the elements that are incredibly valuable to companies. So by all means, make them pay for it. I believe that wholeheartedly. It's also like much harder to get a raise once you're in an organization. I think we've probably all lived through that. It's a common thing than it is to come in, at a, come in at a salary that's not only fair, but is also competitive in the market. So again, if your number to live and maybe have all your bills paid and go out and eat steak once a month, is $65,000 a year, but the market is willing to pay you 85 or 90, but this company can only pay 85, but their competitors are paying 90 or 100. Like you can use all of that as leverage. You can try to get to the highest point of the salary band that they offer. Don't be so quick to just say yes to the first number that they throw out there because oftentimes the budget allows them to kind of scale that up often in ranges of about 15 to 20K. These bands can be big. So the other thing is just like the psychology of negotiation in the sense that I know that it's something that a lot of us don't have a lot of practice in. You know, my mom, my parents both had one job generally their whole career. You know, they just land and they work their whole lives there and they get a pension. And for us, whether we're first generation or we're the first of, our, of this generation, right, to job hunt generally every two or three years in some cases, interviewing and negotiations, we get more experience and more uh, reps at it the more we try and have these conversations. But it's not to say that it should be easy for you day one. But I think the psychology of it to keep in mind is that we will travel far to spend less money on groceries, right? We'll skip the grocery store that's near us because we know their prices are higher. We'll go further out of the way to go to the cheaper Trader Joe's, you know, three miles away. We'll compare gas prices and pick the gas station that we think offers the best value for the price. But we don't always do that when it comes to our salary, but it's the same psychology. If company A is offering this for my skills and company, company B has the budget to offer this, like those are choices that I can make, you know, based on the information that's available to me. We can certainly bring that level of psychology to job hunting as well. I will also say one of the most important strategies is to aim to secure a second offer from another company uh, that just provides leverage. Um, and this is great because again, if a company is saying, hey, we wanna offer you $80,000 for this, you can say, well, I'm expecting an offer from this company and they're telling me that the range is $90,000. Like you already, it's just facts. You just get to kind of point at this other company and say that these are the factual uh, results of your experience with them. And then this company that really wants you will strive to meet or exceed that. So it's just, it really is helpful if you're able to talk to multiple companies at once and get to the offer letter stage from both. And I will also say that like, again, if negotiation makes you uncomfortable, you're not alone, but comfort is not required. What is required is a knowledge of how much the market is willing to pay you for your skills and experience. So again, if you only need $60,000 to live, that's great that you know your number, but you don't give your employer or your prospective employer $60,000 as the number. Do the research to understand what the market is willing to pay for your skills. And if the market is willing to pay $90,000 for your skills, great. You have $30,000 buffer. You can start a business. You can donate. You can do a couple other things with that 30K. You can buy your mom a new roof, whatever that is. It does not matter what your personal number is. The number that matters is what the market is willing to pay for your skills. And so never be afraid to ask for what is fair, given the market value of your skills. And if you're exceptional at what you do, ask for even more. If you know there's not another candidate that they're talking to that is like you, that has your background, your skill set, your ethnicity, whatever that is, ask for the moon. I think it's important to ask for the most based on the research that you've done. And so when you start a job, and I use this in negotiations all the time, specifically with recruiters, because recruiters can tend to be, they're like your advocate, but they, and so they get incentivized when you take a job, but at the same time, some recruiters are not always incentivized to go back and forth in the negotiation process. They just want to close a deal, right? And so sometimes what I will say is, hey, like when I start this job, I want to be focused on the work. I don't want to think about money. And it's just, again, it just brings it back to the reason why we're here is because I want this job. This job wants me. I'm going to do great work once I'm in it. Let's get this money conversation settled, recruiter. Pay me what I'm asking for. And then let's figure out a start date so we can get going. So I love this stuff, y'all. If you ever get stuck, kick it 
is here. I think getting stuck is part of the process. It happens, it's okay. Um, but as for what the market is saying that your skills are worth, check us out at kickingthedoor.com, kicking the door on Instagram. And thank you for the time today. Thank you, Dante. Snap, snap, love it. Uh, also appreciate you highlighting the fact that, you know, just us being women, our background, us just waking up like this, it, there's a value, there's, there's numbers behind that, there's an asset there. So thank you for highlighting that. I think so many women, we need, we need to hear that and be reminded of that daily. Um, next up, we have Miss Paulette Spencer. Hey, Paulette. Um, she is a community engagement policy analyst, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing your story and your tips as well. Thank you, Paulette, for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Um, um, I wanted just to share a bit of my own experience um, coming from this community and um, having left for a couple of years and returned. Um, I am, um, I guess, a Bronxite. Um, my, my, both of my parents are from Jamaica, and uh, I was raised basically in NYCHA housing in the um, 70s and 80s. And um, at the time, I, I guess I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I, I started out life as a, as a musician and um, ended up doing a bachelor's degree in English literature at Queens College and eventually a uh, master's in global public health from New York University, uh, fun specializing in um, policy and management, and, um, and also a um, master's in international political economy and development from Fordham. So for me, my, my journey um, was really one of learning how to shape shift as I learned more and de decided what my interests really were. I think at an early age, my, my, my interests were really more about the policies, how the world worked in, in real terms. And so I, I, can, I can distinctly remember being in a piano lesson and thinking to myself, wow, I'd love to work in international development. And I remember that thought just crossing my mind at the age of like 15. And um, it basically what, what ended up happening is um, I decided that I wanted to work for the UN, but I knew that I didn't have the credentials to be, let's say uh, one of their program officers, which would normally require a, a master's or a PhD because it's highly competitive. And I remember um, uh, a family member saying to me, well, just go in as a secretary. And I realized that going in as a secretary, as an administrative assistant would give me the opportunity to sort of be a fly on the wall. And it, for me, I, I, that was more important to me than anything. And so I remember going and, and going down to the UN and they had a, a um, placement exam. So if you come in and you want to apply as an admin assistant or secretary, you basically have to have the skills as a typist. Uh, so I, I, that's a skill that I highly recommend. Um, and, um, and to see whether or not then they will have a, an opening, whether it's temporary or permanent for someone of your skill set. And I, I remember going there, um, and this was back in 1990, and um, taking the, uh, the exam to, to be a secretary and being on the phone with the recruiter and they were saying, you know, great, you passed the exam, but you didn't have the background that we wanted. <laughs> and I remember talking to her for a good 20 minutes on a payphone, saying, you know, well, what is it that you want me to have so that I can come back um, with the required, with, with, with what you want? And I think basically I ended up kind of tiring them, tiring them in, in the conversation because after 20 minutes, she said to me, okay, do you wanna come in for an interview? And I said, yes. So essentially I, what, I got my foot in the door by I think applying the skills of a typist and um, having the um, sort of diligence in, in making sure that people learn that I, I could do what I said I would do. Um, being there, I discovered a lot of things. I, I learned, I was there for 17 years and, um, and meeting people who are actually on the ground um, internationally and being able to learn from their experience as professionals 
really helped to form me as a person in terms of my awareness of um, in, in politics and in, in policy and my specialty, which is public health. And um, to eventually um, find a program at the university level where they were looking for United Nations staff for a fellowship program. So I ended up applying um, to a program at Fordham University that was specifically aimed towards United Nations staff and the school ended up paying for my master's degree. So for the degree from Fordham University in international political economy, they were basically looking for people with, I think they were asking something like two or three years of, of experience within the international development uh, environment. And at that point, I had had something like 13. And, um, um, you know, with one letter from my uh, chief of the department, basically, I was given a fellowship that was worth about $32,000. And so having, having those skills, and as I think an earlier speaker um, said, you know, having the skills as an admin assistant can, can actually take you quite far. Um, because one, you're able to build things from the ground up. Um, you know, I, I, I see now uh, as I am at BCHN as the community engagement uh, analyst, um, I'm able to be my own secretary. And so it, it gives you a certain self-sufficiency in terms of getting things done that I don't think I would have had had I not been an admin assistant for those, that period of time. Um, when I decided that I would leave the UN, I realized that it was important to really act locally while you're thinking globally. And um, that's when I decided to, well, for other reasons as well, I returned to the Bronx. And um, I ended up working as the director of programs at an agency here called the Bronx Healthling. And I found that job by essentially calling them up and offering to volunteer. And so they, there was some, a, some program that they had. And, and I remember the executive director saying to me, you know, well, what would you like to do for us for this particular program? And I had no idea. I said, I, I'll make copies for you if you want. And so <laughs> I ended up um, showing up there and presenting myself. And at that point, I had had um, both the public health masters from NYU and the the MA from Fordham um, and um, the exposure from the from UNICEF and it, essentially I, that's how I was hired. And uh, you you talk about salary before. What was a very nice surprise was that they actually hired me at the same rate um, that I was receiving when I left the UN after working there for seventeen years. And so that is to say that. Um, it's very, very important to sort of start from the ground up, and especially if you want to discover what your strengths and your weaknesses are and what truly motivates you. And um, so the work that I've been doing now, which is about, I guess this is my fifth year at the Bronx Community Health Network, has really focused around um, bringing communities together. And I should say, I, I skipped over one point, uh, along the personal journey sort of came the question or the, the area of self-esteem and self-confidence. And I know that many people uh, that I was surrounded by growing up here in the Bronx in the 70s and the 80s when the Bronx was burning, <laughs> when, when the, the stigma of being in the Bronx was so very strong you could kind of cut it with a knife in the air. Um, it really kind of played on my mind, you know, in terms of, you know, where you're from, what you bring to the table. And I realized that that sort of vulnerability is something that's very important to acknowledge. And um, I realized that even what I'm seeing now, mental health services are very vital to letting people know that there is a way to, um, to, um, to address areas that might actually prevent you from being your true self, your best self. And so work that I've been doing um, with our 
community and with the agency that I work for, which uh, has a whole team of community health workers, is to look into programs that, um, that people who may or may not be insured can access, um, either in terms of uh, mental health services or other social services. Some of those programs include um, a company called the New York Common Pantry. They're actually a food pantry, but they, they offer uh, an, entire, an entire menu of social services, including um, clinical social counseling, social work counseling. There's also Bronx Works, which also does things in, in terms of health, in terms of employment. Um, there's also an agency called Part of the Solution, which works primarily with a houseless population, but they also offer services in um, mental health as well as employment um, counseling. There's a city, there's a state university of New York, uh, SUNY, um, and there's a program called Attain Lab, and that is for career counseling and outreach. And there's also a SUNY um, uh, uh, Education Opportunity Center. So these are some of the local resources that people from our community can seek out. They can get referrals to these community, to, to these services. And you have staff who will sit with you and, and really cater to your needs, whether that is in, in working out things in your life so that you can be your best self and or getting you connected to services, which, um, which all, all of which influence your overall health. And so that is a bit of my journey. I hope it was great. Well, thank you, Paulette, for sharing that. I'm glad you brought up the whole importance of you know, mental health and making sure we are taking, you know, using our health insurance because that, like you said, it's part of our primary care and making sure that we are use, utilizing those resources so that we are showing up our best self to work and also to the job search as well, because, you know, we're all carrying around baggage and we're not sure if that it may be, you know, that baggage may be uh, a blockage for some of us. So making sure that we're addressing all of our needs, our physical and mental health needs. So thank you for sharing that. And now I have my good friend who's also an attorney um, who I just wanted to highlight her so that she could share her journey and her recent experience within the job market. So uh, Ms. Hala el -Trabagi. Hi everyone, um, I'm Hala. Um, I'm actually really glad that I'm going after um, all of these awesome women <clears throat> because my story actually touches on something that each of them has mentioned. Um, one of the main things I want to talk about is the vulnerability of the situation of looking for a job. So I am an attorney. Um, I am licensed in New York. Um, I worked in New York as a medical malpractice attorney and I lost my job during the pandemic. <clears throat> so it happens to everybody <laughs> is what um, I learned, but also it was a huge um, blow to my self-esteem, my self-confidence and looking for a job is very difficult and overwhelming on its own. But I will say that um, losing a job during the pandemic and um, just being in that situation during the pandemic made it probably a little bit more difficult. Um, needless to say that um, when you are looking for a job and you're looking to get paid for what you're worth, if you have a little bit of a blow to your self-esteem and your self-confidence, it might be a little difficult to ask for what you're worth um, if you're feeling a little down on yourself. So that's definitely something that um, all of these women touched on a little bit. And I just wanna talk a little bit about how I tried to navigate that. And the main thing that I did was reach out to a lot of people. I tried to talk to a lot of people. Um, I don't live in New York anymore. I moved to Florida and that actually made it a little more difficult also because I don't know what people make here in Florida. Um, and I had to also talk to people here in Florida to see, you know, what does an attorney here make? Does it make a difference what town I'm in? Does it make a difference what kind of firm I'm in? So I had to do a lot of research and also talk to a lot of people. Um, I know Ms. Um, 
Yaniel Nunez mentioned LinkedIn during her presentation. And I just wanna say that I completely agree. LinkedIn was very helpful to me. Um, over the years, I have been connecting with a lot of people um, that I meet, who I've worked with, who I've gone to school with. And when I arrived here at Florida, I happened to reach out to an attorney that works here in Florida that I used to work with a couple of years ago in New York. And I told her my situation and she said, you know what, let me just ask my job if they're looking for someone. And she did, and they reached out to me pretty quickly because um, they did need someone. And um, the interesting part is adding to the difficulty of knowing what my value is now is I am not licensed to be an attorney in Florida. I'm still only licensed in New York. So for me, it was this big puzzle of what am I worth here? Um, I'm not barred here, but I've been an attorney for several years and a good attorney, I think. And, um, you know, what do I have to offer them? And it took some doing to figure out what I wanted to ask for. The interesting part is when they reached out to me, they offered me a position that a law student could do and said, oh yeah, and we pay them $25 an hour. And I said, absolutely not. No, <laughs> absolutely not. And um, I was actually very proud of myself because being in that vulnerable position where I really do just want a job, um, it really took a lot out of me to say, no, sorry, I'm not taking that. I know I'm worth more than that. And the response was actually really great. The response was, okay, we understand. Um, your situation is different. Why don't you get back to us and let us know what you want? And then I was like, great. And I took my time. I contacted people I know in New York to reach out to people that they know in Florida. And I talked to people in Florida and not just one type of person. Um, and um, being a woman of color, I actually, I actually also try to make sure that I talk to different types of people. I made sure to talk to a uh, white woman attorney here in Florida. I talked to um, a man um, of color, see what he thought, what would he ask for in this situation? Uh, what would a white man ask for in this situation? Uh, what does someone in Miami versus Tampa ask for in this situation? Like I need to know what everybody's making and what everybody's asking for so that when I do ask for what I want, um, one, it's reasonable, and two, I feel good about it um, because just through my personal journey, I know that I did not ask for enough when I was a recent college grad. I know that I did not ask enough when I was a recent law school grad, and this time around, I wanted to make sure that I asked for the right thing, even though I was in this very awkward weird situation where I was unemployed and not even licensed to work um, in the state. Um, the good news is um, when I asked for the number that I asked for, um, they said, yeah, that sounds good and brought me in for an interview. And I got an offer just last week for more than I asked for. So 10K more than I asked for. And um, as Latoya mentioned, we're um, friends and colleagues. And when I told her this story about, you know, needing to talk to everyone and find out what everybody was making <laughs> and, you know, making sure I wanted to ask for what I was worth, um, she asked me to share the story with you guys. So um, that's my story. Um, I start in April, I start in April, and I'm pretty excited and actually, the best thing that came out of this is I thought that they were going to hire me, not as an attorney, since I'm not licensed here in Florida, but as a law clerk, which is basically like a paralegal, like a law student could do it. Um, and instead, when they offered me the position, they said, you're an attorney, so we're going to hire you as an attorney. And it just really goes to show that all of these things that we tell ourselves and all of these low 
kind of low feelings and low self-esteem and low confidence moments that we have, we need to, yes, accept them because looking for a job is overwhelming and difficult. And you're going to have those thoughts and you just need to accept them. But also, like uh, Ms. Nunez said, do your research. Like Ms. Clemens said, you know, ask for what you're worth. And, um, you know, everybody's advice here is kind of overwhelming when you hear that much advice, but it all does work out in an organized fashion at some point. Um, so um, that's my story. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, Hala. Um, <laughs> I remember you telling me this story and I was on the phone like, what, what, what? No, no. <laughs> but um, it was a good experience because, you know, it really showed how sometimes we had to, you know, reach to people outside of our, you know, cultural background to say, hey, is, is this appropriate to ask? Am I, you know, being lowballed here? And, and having validators and other people to kind of say no that that's appropriate for you to ask for or you know maybe you should try this approach so um i really wanted to highlight Hala's story because it kind of it, it just summed up everything especially during a pandemic where everybody is feeling very vulnerable at this time and you're not sure you know what what should i ask for should i just take the first offer that is presented because i'm in a desperate situation and like like miss clement said you know we can be compounding the loss over the years if we're not asking for what we, we truly deserve and what we, what our values are. Um, so, and of course, you know, you hit on some very good topics too about, you know, the secrecy of salary. So many times, you know, we we put our value based on, well, how much are you making? You know, and then you, you start asking people and then you're you're shocked. You're like, wait, wait a second. You know, I went, I went this, I did this and I'm, I'm only making this amount. And it's, you know, making sure that we're upfront with, you know, <clears throat> what what we want and what we're asking for. So I'm, I'm very grateful that you you shared that. And then Ms. Clemens bringing up, you know, the cultural values of the company. I never really thought about it that deeply, but it, it's such, such, such an important factor to consider when looking for a job because like you said you want to be giving your all to a company that is also serving not only your needs but let's say the needs of your community or the needs of your soul so that was also very important and then of course Paulette with the whole mental health you know I, I just recently um invested in a therapist because I said hey I need help too you know I want to make sure I'm showing up to my job um, the best, the best that I can as well. So I want to thank Miss Paulette for for sharing that as well. If there are any questions, you can um, drop them in the chat right now. I know there were a lot of questions about how to reach uh, reach you, you ladies. So I know Dante shared her hers. You know, you you shared your email, um, Paulette. If you don't mind just sharing your just a way to contact you if people have further questions. If anybody's trying to move to Tampa you know, um, Hala is um, able to um, share share her thoughts. Um, we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, so yeah, if there was any last minute tips that you guys want to share with the viewers, that would be great. So any last minute tips? I wanted to add that the job search in itself can a lot of times feel like a job. Um, and so, you know, naturally as a coach, my ultimate goal is to share like, this is the process. This is what you should be doing. And this is what's going to make your life easier long-term. But listening to Hala reminded me to take a step back and remind everyone to show yourself grace and look at the job search as a way of self-care, right? If you take a one to two hour time frame on a daily basis to either work on your resume one day and like looking at the plan that I shared just create and set aside that one hour for yourself so that like Hala you're doing and you're giving yourself an opportunity to advocate for yourself and make sure that you're giving yourself an opportunity to get the best of everything right whether it's the best of the benefits the best of the location the best of the salary etc um but in the process, just making sure that you show yourself grace because it's not always going to work out in your favor. And that's okay. Because when one door closes, another one opens, right? Let's, as cliche as it sounds, 
um, it is a very real reality. So yeah, just remember to show yourself grace and be patient. And I, I guess I can say from my standpoint as someone who specializes in public health, um, it wasn't until relatively recently that I found out that um, mental health services are considered part of primary care. And so we always think of, of your primary care as your physician who will do immunizations for you, who will give you a checkup, but they're also the, those same physicians are the ones who can ref write referrals for you to, to have mental health counseling, to, to meet with a clinical social worker. So I think it's, it's important that we sort of take care of our whole self. And um, I guess I'm going along with what you just said, Ms. Nunez, and that, um, that we, we have a primary care physician and, and actually hold them close to us and make sure they're the ones that you want. Um, because if you don't care, take care of yourself, you're not, going to, you're not going to be the person you were meant to be. All right, I guess everyone else, they stand by what they already said. So thank you so much, ladies. I really appreciate you all joining me um, today and sharing your words of wisdom that, you know, even to women that were unable to attend today's event, we will record it and allow them to, to be able to view it at a later time. So thank you so much. It's so very much appreciated. And I hope you guys have an amazing day.